This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. Vancouver Lawyers, Dumoulin Boscovich. Did it all begin with a mustard seed, or was it really the Big Bang? Or maybe it was both. Can religion and science ever be reconciled? That's the challenge, and rising to the challenge is our guest today, Daniel Friedman. Mr. Friedman is the president and CEO of MDA Corporation, based in Richmond, for many years, one of Canada's uh, uh, biggest and, and most famous uh, aerospace companies, most famous, of course, for the Canada arm, among other things, but they make their, their money lots of different ways. And Daniel Friedman has written a new book called The Genesis One Code, in which he madly tries to solve the nature of the universe. <laughs> Hello, Daniel. Hi. Yeah. What, what, what gave rise to this? What, I mean, you're a busy guy. You're running a, your president, CEO of a big company. You've got a lot of employees. You've got a family. You've got things to do. <laughs> this is quite an enterprise. Yes, it is. But uh, it's been a, of interest to me for a long time, since I was a kid, actually. Really? And uh, although I went into high tech and business, my first love was really physics. Just couldn't make much money at it. <laughs> yes. So I always kept up with cosmology and physics and so on. And then on the religion side, I've always tried to reconcile the two and, uh, and see how they fit together. What were, what were some of the, before we get into the contents of your book, what were some of the early hints for you that maybe it was possible to find striking similarities? Well, when you first uh, read Genesis, the order of things is pretty more or less, more or less in the right order. And we haven't always known that in science. You know, we couldn't make up our mind whether life started in the oceans or the land and yes. so on. And Genesis always had the order there, and the order has been a pretty good match. So what was remaining in, for me was, what about this business of six days and 6,000 years versus 13? Yeah, billion 13 point seven billion years. Right. Yes, so yeah. That, that was the that was the piece. And then the other piece for me is that when I first studied science, you know, all the answers were there. But by the time you get to about fourth year physics, they start telling you, you know, there's a few things we don't really know. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's and, right. And uh, frankly, we still don't know them. I went to school 30 years ago. We still don't know them. And there's a few things in biblical teaching that, that everyone will readily admit we don't know. We right. don't know, for example how or why or exactly, or maybe we know when, in theory, according to, to biblical studies, man acquired a soul, right? Uh, we know, we know, in the Bible it's pretty straightforward. Yes. In science we don't even know if we have a soul yet. Yes, of course. We're still arguing. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, in your book, and it's an amazing, fascinating read, in your book there are a whole bunch of really exciting ideas, but one in particular kind of blew my mind. and. I, I think this is the experience when you dive into this kind of stuff. And that is that the Big Bang theory of science, uh, I, a, a minuscule, minuscule sort of non-world, suddenly rapidly expanding, is actually matched by text in the Torah. In the, in the commentaries. In the commentaries, in the Talmud. Yeah, yeah. Okay. in the commentaries. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, what happens is, you know, as you study this, you discover that, that the Hebrew language is not just words. Yes. It's also formulas, because yeah. every letter has a number, therefore every word is a number, and every sentence is a number, and so on. And they all have numerical values. They all have numerical values. Right. And every letter is a pictograph. So it, it the buh of, of the first word, right? Uh, Bereshit, yeah, right. in the beginning. In the yeah. beginning. Yeah. So the guys that really understand this, they're not just reading English, or they're not just reading Hebrew, yeah, like when you read yeah, English. Yeah. They're reading mathematical formulas. They're reading pictographs. It's more like reading a chemistry equation. <laughs> yes. And and the guys that do this and put all the pieces together, uh, you know, back hundreds of years ago, uh, the interpretation of what that first paragraph of Genesis means when you write it down, as I did in, in the book there, uh, copied from his book, reads almost identically 
to what you would see today in Scientific American as a description of the Big Bang. Yes. I mean, word for word, except for our current language, is almost identical. You know, we call it an infinitesimally small thing, and he calls it a grain of mustard. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. But he talks about expanding forever. We talk about expanding forever. We talk about everything came from this that. This is Ramban. Right. Everything so, came from that bit. So, so Ramban, this, this particular human being who lived 800 years ago right. and wrote 800 years ago, his, for some reason or other, his inspiration or his picture of what he understood about the beginning of the world was this mustard seed that yeah. suddenly just... And it's, it's completely parallel to the Big Bang Theory, which is only 50 years old. The Big Bang Theory is only 50 years yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's just, oh. it's just developed in the last 50 years. Oh, I probably and, read yeah. it and, and lost it amidst, amidst all the I mean, there were the precursors, but, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's definitely there was no sign of it when Rambam was writing. Right. Yeah. So let, 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 let's go to the science for a moment. Okay. Uh, how do we know that the world is 13.75 billion years old? Because I know that not only do you state this many times, but I've read, because I'm studying astronomy these days, that... that Everybody seems to agree. This yeah. is how old the universe is. So that, you know, there's many ways to, that we know. We have all these instruments, uh, telescopes, satellites yes. with telescopes, yes. other instruments that measure microwave background and so on. And we can see, actually, uh, quite far away. And because light takes time to travel, like if you make a long distance call, you can, you can hear the delay. You see it on TV all the time, actually, the yes, delay from of the, course. Yes, the yeah. satellite interview. Yeah. Well, by the same reason, when we look at the sun, that light left the sun eight minutes ago. So we're looking at the sun, it's eight minutes, eight minutes earlier. We can now see back 12 billion years. We've seen stars that where the light left 12 billion years ago with the Hubble telescope. So we know it's not 6,000 years old. Right. <laughs> to, get, to get to the 13.75, uh, we have all these instruments that measure all these parameters about the universe, and, uh, and you, p you, you fit them in mathematically with Einstein's equations, and it comes out pretty exactly to the 13.75. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't understand until I read your book that, that the Hubble, the, the one right. floating around in space, that that one actually sees to what we can almost comically call the edge of the universe. Not, not quite yet, but yeah. uh, a long ways. A long, darn close. Darn close. Uh, what's out there? Everything? Well, what's out there yeah. is the way things were 11, 12 billion years ago, which is yes. much smaller, much more crowded. Yes. The, uh, you know, the, the galaxies are not quite formed yet. They're messier. Yes. They're not like our galaxy. Yeah. And so on. It's, it's exactly what the scientists expect, actually. Okay. Talk about the, the uh, uh, puzzle, the conundrum of three different kinds of days. You talk about uh, human days, creation days, divine days. Okay. Please. Okay, well, you know, first of all, let's talk about ourselves. We, yes. we, know, we know what a day is, and we know what time is. We have all kinds of sophisticated instruments, but one of them is our heart. We can count heartbeats, so we kind of can tell what time it is, and that, that's what I call human time yes. in the book, scientific time. That's yes. the 13.7 billion years. Right. The other uh, time that's pretty explicit in the Bible is the six days of creation. So it's creation for six days, seventh day rest, and then the clock starts... Uh, like we would normally start a clock, and in fact a lot of other people have done work to show that many of those elements in the Bible are correlated to history reasonably close. So after this, the seven days, things match history in a reasonable approximation. But the question is, what are those... What is a day? What is a creation and, day? And you're not the first person to suggest that, that what we think of as a day when we read Genesis, uh, you know, God did this and he did that and so on, that in fact, those days equal millions of years. Yeah. That people, have, people have, you know, thought of that many times in the past. You know, maybe a day is not a day, and therefore we can, that's a way to reconcile things. Yes. What's unique in my book is I've gone into the sources and said, you know, where's the formula? I mean, how, if somebody wrote this thing in a, in a code, yes. where a day is not really one of our days, well, w what is it? What exactly is it? Well, you do some pretty fancy footwork in this book. <laughs> not, too, not too fancy. <laughs> well, well, but you're a mathematician and an engineer, are yeah. you not? Yeah. Yes. So it's very, it's very interesting the way you've multiplied by a couple of factors and end up getting these two what seem to be disparate ideas that, that, uh, that, that, that uh, judicial procedures have fought about, right? The Scopes trial, right. evolution, creation. You get them to match. 
Yes. Not only in the age of the universe, uh, in which some people say, well, you worked it out backwards. That's, that's, yes. what, I, that's, what, I, that's what I hear. Yes. But it matches all the other events in Genesis except, except one. It matches the age of the sun, the age of the moon, the first life in the oceans, the Cambrian explosion, which is when most of life came to be. It matches all these events that are described in Genesis and in science. And the scientific uh, data comes from three different sources. You know, the, the Big Bang Theory yes. gives you the age of the universe. The solar system studies, we've gone to the moon, we study the sun, tells you that. And then, of course, the fossil record uh -huh. tells you all about life. So you've got three completely different scientific sets. And with one very straightforward formula, they match all the words in Genesis. I can't, you can't fudge that. <laughs> There's no way to do it. Well, there is. There is one. There. There was one moment where I felt, and maybe unfairly, <laughs> yeah, no, Friedman, that you made a kind of leap of faith. If I can find it, uh, maybe I'll have to do it during the during the break. Uh, you you made you made a jump that sort of startled me. Okay. Okay. And and I sort of. I looked at this and I said, well, uh, how did you get to that? <laughs> uh, uh, where, oh, here it is. On page 51, you say the Torah must be accurate as a description of events and timing. But I don't understand this must be. Okay. Okay, so my premise, which I think is, is a little bit uh, different than in the past, is I've gone to the scientists and I've said, okay, you, you're, the, you're the smart guys. You worked it out. Tell me yes. what science is. Yes. I go to the Bible. And I say, uh, I'll, I'll take your word for it. Yes. So that's what I mean by it must be accurate. So if you were going to tell a story to your kids about something that happened in your past, and you told them a date and a place, now that's not a big part of the story. But why would you put the date and the place in the wrong, the wrong thing? So the, the, the Bible is telling us moral stories. But it's going through a lot of effort to tell us that you know the sun was made before life, and this was made before that, and yes. this was made after that. So that, that, that's not pulled out of the air. That must be accurate. <laughs> it right? must be. It must be accurate. When I tell, when I tell my daughter you know, yeah. that I was born in Chile and yeah. I came here and I did this and yeah. I tripped over that. Yeah, and those are reasonably accurate Yeah, and I tell her roughly the dates yeah, and how yeah, old yeah. I was yeah, yes. and you know, what my yeah. father said and so yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't see why uh, when you write a moral story, you wouldn't, if you're putting a setting in it, which is what the Bible is doing with the, the whole creation thing, you wouldn't be accurate. So, uh, and of course, all the commentaries say it's accurate. So I take each study as accurate. I don't, I don't try to argue against it or for it. I just, just take it at face value. Okay. Do they match? And it and turns out that they do. On, on what happened yes. and when it happened. They don't match on how. And the how is still mysterious. The how, science has a how, and yeah. the Bible has a how. Yes. It's a famous creation evolution controversy. Yes. But the, the objective evidence we have today is we can go dig a hole and look for a dinosaur and say it's that old. And we can, we can say humans right. began at a certain point and, and, so and then there's this whole discussion about what, what the, f the real atom was and not the atom that we picture today. Right. Yeah. So we'll, we know the what and the when. Okay, we'll get, to, we'll get to that. We're going to take a little break. Heavy stuff, it's, it makes the brain rattle. Uh, we'll take a little break, folks. I remind you that uh, davidburner.com is the site. Uh, to send us uh, emails or commentaries of any kind. Uh, always happy to hear from you and also give a moment of exposure to our friends who have been so supportive of this program here on Community, uh, sorry, Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Back in a moment. KCM Wealth Management. Vancouver lawyers Dumoulin Boscovich. The Vancouver Courier newspaper. Creation-evolution controversy, of course,
covers many grounds. It's, it's cultural, it's political, uh, it's theological, it's pedagogical. It, it, it really fits into every version of argument, and we, we endlessly sort of like to debate these things. But our guest, Daniel Friedman, who's the president and CEO of McDonald Detweiler, so MDA, no longer McDonald Detweiler, MDA uh, in Richmond, uh, which is an aerospace company, has written a wonderful, fascinating new book called The Genesis One Code, in which he argues and demonstrates that uh, science and religion, in fact, are very much in sync and they very much match. And it's filled with all kinds of little treasures, like this one. Does the book of Genesis prove that science is right? Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Question, why do the universe's parameters exist in narrow life-giving range? I mean, that is, that's a puzzle, isn't it? It's a huge puzzle. There's, there's several puzzles left in science. And yes. The biggest one, and some argue the only one in cosmology, is that we can explain everything from the point of the Big Bang on. Yes. But at that point, all kinds of things had to be defined, like the mass of a proton or the mass of a neutron. And if you change any one of those a tiny bit... None of it follows. N n nothing works out. Right. So it's incredibly fine... It's called... The universe is incredibly fine-tuned. Yes. And it's called the fine-tuning problem. And in science, there's no good explanation today. There are competing theories, but there's no good accepted explanation for why it, it should be so fine-tuned. I mean, what we were expecting to find a scientist is that, you know, it didn't really matter if I put this cup here or in the middle of the table and so on, yes. it would stay on the table. But it turns out that every time you put the, 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 the cup down at the beginning of the universe, it's right on the edge. It either falls or doesn't fall. It's not yes. stable. Yeah. So it's very finely tuned. And, and we don't have a good answer for that in science. I think we have a good answer for that in Genesis. All right. And we, don't, we also don't have a good answer for the design. Because if, if you go into the furthest reaches of outer space, and then zoom quickly back down to the atomic, subatomic level of anything, you know, of a cucumber or, or my thumb, we get a similar design, which is so bizarre. Yeah, the, you know, the, the, the famous, the fives and the tens are everywhere. Yeah. And, and so on. But science would argue that it has a reasonable explanation for that. Uh, once, once you get the thing started in the right direction at the beginning, and you get certain laws of physics happening and, and certain parameters, the rest uh, you would have a hard time arguing with a scientist whether you can explain it or not. But the beginning is the problem. Talk about the Cambrian explosion. And did we have an explain? Explain what it is, and then do we have an explanation for that? Okay. So uh, if, if we look at the fossil, the fossil record is just the buried remains that we find. Anytime we dig a hole, we find some bone or, right, s or right. some feces something. or something. Yes. And we can put that back together. Everybody's familiar with the dinosaurs. You know, they put the, the bones back together and they figure out what a dinosaur looked like. And they, we can date that and, and see what it is. So we actually have a photo album of life that's ever existed on Earth. From the is, very is everything, is every living thing carbon and water? Uh, I'm not an expert on that, oh, but okay. I, I think so. I, I, think, I think it is. Yeah. I think that's sort of what I, one of the things I gleaned from your book. Yeah. But, okay. So we can go back to three and a half billion years ago when we heard the first uh, microscopic thing in the in the water yes and work our way all the way through to today and we have a fairly complete photo album of what existed when and what it looked like and so on but you point out in your book that for five sixths of the right. endless period of life uh, of the universe life was unicellular right so you know we have this microscopic thing not a lot happens for a billion plus years <laughs> yes. and then in a very short time frame, we basically have the, uh, what's called the Cambrian Explosion. It's an appropriate yes. name. Yeah. Why? Because at the, it, it's the, cam the, the, the period of time is called the Cambrian. Okay. So we go from unicellular life for billions of years, and yes. all of a sudden we have the most complex and fantastic marine life, from marine plants to massive-looking uh, creatures, creatures yes. to small things. Yeah. Not only that, at a, at a fundamental biological level, the kind of building blocks that will be used to build all other life afterwards yes. are all there. Uh, they're, they're, all, they're all available there. So in a very, very short time, the whole diversity of life appears. 
And then after that, and those are not my words, but the more famous people, after that you just get variations in the theme. Okay, so just hold on that thought for a minute. So do we have any scientific explanation and or is there anything in the Bible that talks about this fallow period of billions of years where there's apparently not much going on? Uh, why, would, why would life be designed, if in fact it's designed, to sort of wander around doing not much of anything for an awful long time, and then suddenly this explosion of activity. Okay, well, let me, you know, you asked science and, and, yeah, yeah, and the Bible. Yeah. On the science side, there are some theories that, you know, that conditions were ripe and certain things happened and uh -huh. there was a lot of innovation and evolution and so on and so forth. Okay. But it's fair enough to say that at this stage it's still a bit of a mystery and there's competing theories. And in fact, there's one of the issues with the theory of evolution. Some people have uh, proposed the punctuated theory of evolution where you know, Darwin thought everything kind of evolves naturally yes, yes, and slowly. Yes, yes, yes. These guys are saying, no, it kind of doesn't do a lot, and then all of a sudden fits it does a lot. Fits and starts. Yeah, fits and starts, Yeah, and so on. The Bible is really straightforward. The Bible just says, you know, this is when this happened, this is when this happened, and this is when this happened. And when it says, and God made the animals, it yeah. corresponds with the Cambrian explosion. Really? Yeah, exactly. 532 million years ago. It comes out to the same number. Okay, exactly. that, 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 and that's the kind of thing you kept doing in your book, yeah, right? Yeah, about 20 times. By working, yeah, you did that many times in your book, yeah. working out the, the, the numbers of how it's, they it's correspond. It's just one simple formula. Yeah. Actually, you know, the book is kind of presented so people can read it. Um, at home, I just have an Excel spreadsheet that yes. has all the scientific terms and has the biblical story, and then it just applies a conversion factor, and they just line up. Spooky. Uh, Spooky. Okay, talk about these periods of extinction, because that's fascinating. Well, this is another uh, uh, part that, you know, alive today is only about 5% of what's ever existed or less. Yes, yes, Many yes. things, we all know about the dinosaurs, but there's many, many more species. There were millions of species. Yes, that went extinct. Yes. And uh, species are going extinct all the time, naturally. Yes. But there were these kind of five major extinct what are called extinction events, yes. which by and large are thought to um, scientifically be due to some major cataclysmic event like a meteor hitting the earth and, and, and just changing the climate for a while and, and that's what's thought to have wiped out the dinosaurs. Yes. Now, does that, does, do any of those things correspond to biblical stories? Now, this is getting a little further away from the straight text, yes. but uh, we're told in the sources pretty clearly that all of these things are there for us to eat and master and, 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 you know, we're supposed to be the, the main thing. And whenever we cause a problem, we cause a problem with the whole world. Yes. And what I was able to find in the sources is that Adam did five no-nos in his life. He did? Yeah. And these are, uh, these correspond pretty precisely to the five times that life went by and large extinct. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, and, and so, of course, in your picture, of Adam is that Adam was something, a creature, not not quite what we know as a fellow. It didn't look like you and me, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and he extended over great long periods of time. Right. right. He extended, well, he extended over day six, and day six was a very long period of time. As in millions of years. Yeah. And, 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 and so uh, his mistakes, uh, uh, like uh, the tree of knowledge and so on, those kinds of mistakes, what, what we're calling errors and mistakes, in, in fact, you're saying correspond to periods of uh, extinction, extinction of, uh, of well, species. It says right in Genesis yes. that, you know, as soon as, as, soon yeah. as Adam and Eve sin, yes. it says the ground is accursed because of you, and it says exactly what happened to the ground and to the vegetation. And what killed the dinosaurs is a change in the vegetation. Yes. Now, we think that happened by a meteor hitting the earth, blocking the sun, killing the vegetation, killing the dinosaurs. The Bible says that Adam did what he wasn't supposed to do and the vegetation was changed. How, how, does, how does a story like Noah's Ark fit into this time frame? Uh, oh, that's not, that's not in this time frame. Noah's Ark is well after. Ah. Okay, so we're talking okay. just the six days of creation. Yeah, yes, yes. And then you'll have to read my next book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to figure that out. I, I see. Okay, let's, we just have a minute or two left. Let's just talk about human life as, as we know it. It's very interesting that some version of Homo sapiens or, or some version of Homo something or other showed up two million years ago. Mm -hmm. Modern humans, only 195,000. And then human beings with language and culture and sensitivities of one kind or another, 
music maybe 50,000 or maybe only 10,000 years ago. Yeah, most people think it's 60,000 or so years ago. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. So we, we have all of these uh, uh, human-looking things in the fossil record starting about 6 million years ago with a common human chimpanzee ancestor. Yes. And we have all this kind of uh, progression, maybe 18, 19 different types of, of, of things that you and I would look and say, yeah, that's kind of a... Almost. Getting close to a human. Yeah. And then we have something that looks just like I us. I look at people in coffee shops like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, you know, 200,000 years ago, we have something that we would both say, yeah, you know, that, that, that could be my cousin. Yes. Um, but he's sitting around in Africa, barbecuing meat and hanging around, and, and he's not building super fantastic tools. He's certainly not, not painting too many caves. Yes. He's not transacting any commerce and so on. That only starts to happen 100,000, 60,000 or so years ago. And we don't have a good explanation in science for that. We're, we're pretty much out of time. Does doing this project make you feel better? Other than the fact that you managed to write and publish a book, does it make you feel better that, that you, you, you do feel a true sense of reconciliation? Yes, I do, yeah. I mean, there's still lots of questions. Yes. Still, and I'm working on some of those for my sequel, but, uh, yes. but it's, a, it's a true sense of reconciliation. Uh, Daniel Friedman, wonderful Thank you. stuff. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, the book again, The Genesis One Code. Daniel Friedman is the author. Reconciling uh, Creation and Evolution. Fascinating. All right, next week. What are we doing next week? Oh, Greg Smith is with what used to be called Planned Parenthood, but is now called Options for Sexual Health. And as, of, as I have had no sexual health for most of my life. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, he, will, he will join us and we'll talk about why the Americans are going on and on in the primaries about Planned Parenthood. What is the problem? I thought all these issues like abortion and contraception had been solved. Thanks for being with us uh, this evening. Uh, as always, it's great to have you here on Shaw Community Television, Cable 4. Good night.